Hello and welcome to the 19th European Week of Regions and Cities, a joint collaboration between the European Commission and the European Committee of the Regions. I'm Mariam Zaidi and I'm going to be your host for this opening ceremony. First of all, a big thank you to everyone who is, of course, joining us online. We appreciate you being with us more than you can understand, especially in these rather strange COVID times when we can't all fully be together. But saying that, we do also have a COVID-safe studio audience made up of members of the Committee of the Regions and journalists. So a big welcome to all of you uh, in the studio. Over the next one and a half hours, we're going to be talking about how EU regional policy can really change and shape European citizens' lives. It's, and of course, we are the biggest annual flagship event dedicated to EU cohesion policy, so why not? Uh, joining me to host this special event, though, are Betty and Alejandro. Hi, Mariam. Hi, Alejandro. Very happy to be here on site and online today. There are more than 1,600 people from all over Europe following us live, be it on the events platform, via web streaming, or on Facebook and Twitter. So, we're really looking forward to your participation. Right, Alejandro? That's right, Betty. We'll be happy to read your comments, experiences, and reactions, so don't hesitate to share them on the live chat of the platform, on Facebook, and on Twitter. So, don't forget to use the hashtag EU Regions uh, Week, and we'll be keeping an eye on them. Once again, hashtag EU Regions Week. Thank you, Betty and Alejandro. And as they were saying, you know, don't forget to send all of their message, all of your comments, anything that you want to comment about to Betty and Alejandro and use that hashtag EU Regions Week. And if you want to also, you can also tweet me at Saidi underscore Mariam. Now, I'm hearing that already we have over 15,000 participants, uh, people that have registered online, over 1,000 speakers, and we have over 300 digital events that are taking place uh, across the four days. And as you can see here, well, I've got a few uh, empty sofas. Well, don't worry, because we're going to have a whole bunch of special guests who are going to be joining me to be sharing you know, their key messages and their visions for a, a common European future. And let's be honest, that word future, for the last year and a half or so, that future hasn't really felt all too good because of this COVID-19 pandemic. But at least we are now here. We're past the worst phase of the pandemic. And that's the theme uh, of this event where we go from emergency to recovery. Well, on that note, uh, let's now start our discussion and open the debate. So let me welcome to the EU Regions Week living room, Ms. Elisa Ferreira. She's the European Commissioner for Cohesion and Reforms, and she's also the co-host for this event. Ooh. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Should we... Perfect. Take a seat, please. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Ferrer, thank you so much for being here. It's really a pleasure to have you uh, on set with us. So just quickly, what is this event about for you? What's important about it? It is exactly what you were just mentioning. We are coming out of a crisis, very, very big crisis, but uh, we reacted this time. There was emergency support, so the impact was lower than what we feared. And now the question is how to move in this transition period from emergency into sustainable growth with all these uh, questions of uh, being more climate friendly, being ma more digital, more innovative, but at the same time being more cohesive. And that's our challenge, but we have got instruments to do it. So let's work together and let's deliver. Yeah, so it's definitely a challenge, but also it's an opportunity, as you say. It is a big opportunity. Exactly. Okay, well, Ms. Ferreira, um, <laughs> Commissioner Ferreira isn't alone on this set. Let me now also welcome to the EU region's living room, uh, Apostolis Tisikostas, the president of the European Committee of the Regions and also a fellow co-host. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, President. Oh, watch out for the ring. I apologize if it Thank smashes you. you on your knuckles. <laughs> So, Mr. President, thank you also for being here with myself uh, and Commissioner Ferreira. Uh, we're really appreciative of, of you being here. So, just quickly, Mr. President, what can people uh, expect across these four days? Well, these four days are very important for us, for regions and cities, because during these four days, where we will have 12,000 participants, we will have 1,000 speakers, and in 300 events, 
we will be able to discuss not only uh, the lessons that we learned from the uh, pandemic that we had, the, the health crisis that we had these 20 months, but also how we will recover from it. Because now we are entering the recovery phase. And it is very important to realize that in order for the recovery to be quick and successful, we need to involve regions and cities. Because regions and cities know exactly what the problems of every region and cities are and how to allocate these unprecedented recovery plans to the specific needs of the citizens. So that's exactly what we need to discuss. And in these thematic topics, we will discuss the pandemic, the health issues, we will discuss the Green Deal, the digitalization, and many, many other aspects that affect the 400 million citizens of Europe through its 300 regions and 90,000 municipalities. Perfect. Well, it's going to be a fantastic discussion across the borders, of course. Um, and of course, you're going to hear a lot more from both uh, Commissioner Ferreira and President Titi Costas throughout this program. But time now to, of course, kick off uh, our first session. And the theme is cohesion policy from emergency to recovery. <laughs> Now, there is, of course, no question that the COVID-19 pandemic has changed all of our lives in some ways, well, terrible, and in some ways it's offered opportunity for us to change. Uh, the first session is really about understanding now the impact that this crisis has had on European regions and cities. Are there common challenges that perhaps have common solutions? Can structural funds perhaps re-energize and reform and refocus the way in which we are all living? Well, to kick off our debate, David Sassoli, the president of the European Parliament, was meant to be joining us remotely from Rome. Unfortunately, he has had to um, cancel last minute. He cannot attend. But right here, I do have this uh, message uh, from the president. Let me just read it all to you now. So he has said to President Titi Costas and to Commissioner Ferreira and of course representatives uh, of the regions and cities. He says that he is sorry that he cannot be with everyone today due to exceptional circumstances but he would like to send his greetings in view of the important reflection on working together for recovery. He carries on and says that cities and regions are already in the front line of daily assistance to citizens and businesses. They know best the problems after the pandemic. They know what is needed to restart and also where we need to invest to transform our local realities in order to improve people's lives. He adds that, of course, cohesion policy must play a central role in moving from emergency to recovery, but without leaving anyone, and especially in the regions, behind. The pandemic has taught us that we need to update our democracies and strengthen our pact with citizens. We count on you and on your active involvement in this great exercise uh, of democracy uh, to bring about the necessary uh, reforms of our union. And he also thanks all of us. So that's a lovely message there, no? from the President uh, of the European Parliament. But let's now move on then to our first video. So. Access to affordable healthcare is, of course, the cornerstone of any society. Cross-border healthcare in particular is a right, if you didn't know this, it's a right guaranteed by EU law. In this video, you're going to see an EU project between Italy and Slovenia, which aims to help the most vulnerable, so children with autism, those who are suffering from mental health uh, issues, and also people who are pregnant. Do take a look. Hello, I work for the AGTC GO, an Italian public authority founded by two cities in Slovenia and one municipality in Gorizia. And uh, we work cross-border in Italy and Slovenia, and we are implementing an EU uh, project, uh, Salute Zdravstvo, under the Interreg Italia Slovenia program. The 
the Salute Transfer project targets the most vulnerable, vulnerable citizens of our region, uh, starting from small children with autism spectrum disorder, young uh, people with mental health problems who need to be uh, taken care of for individually in the approach uh, based on the whole experience from uh, social education, employment and accommodation. Then uh, it tackles also physiological pregnancies, so future moms and social inclusion, which is in this period of COVID more important than ever. To make it simple, if you are a pregnant woman living in Gorizia, you can participate in gymnastic course, gymnastics in water, gymnastics in water with your baby in Slovenia or in Italy, depending on where the activity is held. So you can go cross-border to uh, enjoy these services. It is uh, extremely important for the project manager to have EU funds because without them, uh, the project wouldn't be able to be implemented. In our case, with the Salute Drasto project, uh, the EU funds a, um, made possible pilot actions, and this pilot action gave the possibility to test the activities, see the response of the citizens, and the implementing body themselves. Uh, seeing how effective these activities are, then choose to carry out the activities themselves and continue these activities. So the EU funding have a long-term impact. A lovely initiative there. So, Commissioner Ferreira, that is really... Um, a fantastic example of how European investment is really helping local and regional authorities to help deal with this pandemic, especially as we try to obviously move beyond it now. Uh, but what are really the instruments for boosting a longer term recovery? Well, this is uh, exactly what we are talking about. Together we are stronger. And uh, there is a line of uh, cohesion funding that is exactly directed to this cross-border support, because sometimes the equipment you are looking for is just the other side of a uh, border that is politically, but that, uh, I mean, socially and, and, and environmentally, you, you don't recognize it. Uh, but uh, for long-term recovery, you, we have exceptional funding these times. We have uh, the funding for which we went to borrow. Commission was authorized and took the initiative and went to borrow, and this borrowing uh, is uh, massively invested in uh, more than uh, 600 billion uh, kind of, of recovery plans. And all the member states know this, uh, it's known as RRP, but it's Recovery and Resilience Plan. But on the other hand, you have more than 309, uh, 390 or so uh, around this, uh, this figure uh, to support cohesion multi-annual programs. And so by bringing these uh, instruments in a synergetic way, we have historical support for a long-term recovery that has got to be more future-oriented, more digital, more cohesive, and uh, also more environmentally sensitive. Uh, so what we have to do all together is to make the best of this incredible opportunity and to make it come down to the citizens through the regions, through the local entities, so that everybody can share this stimulus for a more sustainable growth. And this is what our life will be in 10 years' time. So we are determining what our decisions now will be determinant for where all of us will be uh, in, uh, I mean, in one decade. So it's really a huge responsibility. That's why we are asking everybody to work under a kind of a partnership uh, system so that everybody has a say in mm. what we are going to do together. That sounds brilliant. A really top-down approach is perfect. So, President Tisigostas, what are the steps to help foster health and social recovery, really saving lives um, and protecting uh, local economies, in your opinion? 
Well, I think it's, it's clear the crisis has affected everyone. Mm. Uh, but of course, the most affected are the people who are the most in need. And so uh, our report that will be published this week uh, shows that the young and the low-skilled workers were affected the most. And that unemployment rate is about higher by 10 percent for young people than for the general population. So it is very clear that we have a risk here, a risk to have a COVID lost generation. And this is what we need to avoid. Now, how do we avoid this? This can be avoided only if we manage to work together, but with the regions and the cities having a protagonistic role in the recovery phase. Again, we are the actors who have the proximity with the citizens and the real needs. And so we are the ones who can help out both in the designing of these programs and the implementation on where these funds should go in order to cover on the issues that at hand. And uh, this is exactly why we believe that we need a place-based approach on most of the issues. The health issue where we saw that there were different uh, different numbers and different situation depending on the region and the city of Europe we were talking about, but also a place-based approach on how we will invest in our future now with the recovery programs. No, that definitely makes sense because you can't have just a blanket approach because obviously there are so many different member states and different you know, regions and sensitivities, so we need to have a different approach. Okay, so Commissioner Ferrer uh, and President Sigostas. You're going to have to make a little bit of space on the sofas uh, because we're now going to welcome to our EU region's living room two more guests. Uh, Mr. Yunus Omarji, the chair of the Committee on Regional Development at the European Parliament, or REGI Committee, and also Natalie Sarabetzolis, member of the C European Committee of the Region's Commission uh, for Territorial Cohesion Policy and EU Budget. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, there we go. Okay, set that. Perfect. Okay, thank you uh, both so much uh, for joining us on the sofa. Uh, joining all of us, I should say, joining all of us uh, on the sofa. So, Ms. Sarabetsol is coming to you first. Can you tell us how cohesion policy helped Europe respond to the pandemic? And what are the main challenges for both local uh, and regional authorities today? Well, as a local elected representative, like many others, we saw the pandemic hit our territory and the people had turned to us and we had to find solutions and answers very quickly. And we had to enter into a partnership. We had to uh, find the, the means and resources very quickly and the cohesion funds were very useful in my region we managed to uh, buy masks uh, to uh, give the healthcare workers and in many territories uh, we also had to recruit more care staff so it allowed us to make progress there and I think what we need to do now is think how can we use the cohesion policies to overcome inequalities that existed already, inequalities that have been aggravated, new vulnerabilities, new uh, inequalities, not only between people, but also between regions. I mean, that's what the cohesion policy is all about. So many initiatives have seen the light of day. And over this period of the pandemic, we've seen new facilities and our objective is to continue. We have to be more inventive, more creative, act more speedily. Many initiatives have already been taken. In fact, we've shared them on the platform of the Committee of the Regions. Everyone has had to share their experience, which has allowed us to make progress because the issue of inequalities is absolutely fundamental for all local authorities. If you're going to work on a local level, you have to react speedily. You have to talk about cohesion and uh, welfare, whether we're talking about housing policies, transport policies. It's not incompatible with sustainability, of course, uh, but we've uh, had different experiences across uh, Europe. Uh, 
Uh, in Budapest, for example, uh, they've uh, uh, invested in free transport for the young. Uh, many initiatives have come to the fore. So it's not just about cohesion policies. It seems to me we need to think about uh, overall policies, uh, taxation, mobility, not just cohesion, because we need to work together all the municipalities to make sure that uh, we can do what we need to for our local municipalities. The European Parliament and your Reggie Committee have played a big role in really deploying emergency aid during this pandemic. But the pandemic itself isn't Europe's only crisis, as this fair, uh, Commissioner Ferrer will know. So how can regions and territories now really bounce back? Oui. Je pense que la crise du COVID. I think the COVID crisis was a major shock for all the regions of Europe. And with Commissioner Ferreira, we felt that there was no way we could just sit back with our arms folded. So, as you know, we've taken emergency measures which helped regions to buy masks respirators and to help people who were partially on unemployed and that made it possible to get over the crisis we've been able to save lives in Europe I think at this stage we can draw certain conclusions I think we've all seen how valuable this policy has been I keep saying this, Europe was born out of solidarity and at a time of crisis we saw that Europe could die for lack of solidarity and that only the cohesion policy could save us. The second lesson we can learn is that the cohesion policy, which by some people is considered very unwieldy very complex, that's what the detractors say. I think the cohesion policy has shown that it can react to a crisis. And when a crisis happens, the first policy that is affected is the cohesion crisis. That was what happened with the COVID crisis. It's also what happened in the context of Brexit, because we adopted the Brexit Adjustment Fund and we now have the obligation to keep a weather eye on the medium and long term. The long term objective is, of course, to get the recovery on the ground. That's React EU is, React EU is, of course, the way we've done this. And I think it's very important because it shows the flexibility of the cohesion policy. We've come out of all the intellectual rigidity and we've been able to show a lot of flexibility and we've been able to give the regions uh, regulations which are very flexible and as Commissioner Ferrer said, we have the challenge of the transition which is almost upon us and we've got the climate transition coming up as well. So in the new regulations for 21-27, the ones that we have negotiated, we've taken on this responsibility because the cohesion policy is the first pillar of the Green New Deal in Europe. We have decided that 30% of funds will be earmarked for those objectives. And we've also adopted the principle that there should be no investment which is contrary to our long-term objectives. So in the cross-cutting vision at the moment, nothing should shake cohesion. And therefore this challenge of the cohesion needs to be shouldered in all our policies at European level. 
because there is a need to make sure that all policies are consistent and what we build up should not be destroyed by other EU policies. Yes, thanks, Mariam. Indeed, our first guest for today is going to be a young locally elected politician from Italy, Daniel Terzariol. Daniel is a deputy mayor in Santona di Piave in Italy, and above all, he is a passionate young elected politician, <laughs> member of the YET Network. Hi, Daniel. Welcome. Hi there. How are you? Fine, thanks. Excellent. Happy to have you with us. So, Daniela, you are a young elected politician uh, contributing to making Europe closer to the citizens of San Donati Piave. Your experience is common to many other young politicians in Europe. Could you tell us a bit about the energy and the motivation that you need in a small, medium-sized city to become more European and to bring and take advantage of the European opportunities? Well, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniele. I'm the deputy mayor for the city of uh, San Donato di Piave, a thriving municipality, the eighth in the Veneto region, with uh, 42,000 inhabitants close to Venice. Uh, I have the honor of representing the hundreds of uh, local young elected politicians who work every day among many difficulties to make their cities, which are often mediums more, more European. The first reflection that uh, I'd like to share with you is precisely about this topic. Why large cities continue to grow today, the 40% settlements uh, in Europe are shrinking and most of them belong to small and medium-sized urban areas where a third of the European population lives and where there is a significant demographic decline. In these cities, the sustainable police management has become a strategic goal. For municipalities like San Donato di Piave, the sustainability of a local, local government action to guide us from the emergency period to the one of the recovery, it's a fundamental lighthouse idea. In the post-COVID reality, more than even before, every city finds strength in resilience, but above all, it's a new life in EU cohesion policies. Thank you very much, Daniele. Could you please share with us any direct experience you might have with an EU project? Yes, well, uh, during my experience as a deputy mayor, I've uh, engaged uh, San Donati Piave in a Eurobuck project, uh, a European program that uh, works on developing cognitive uh, changes in citizenship uh, rather than uh, building infrastructural transformation. The construction of uh, shared community values is a primary purpose uh, for conscious uh, and uh, sensitive administration that uh, want to improve the livability of places uh, and their development uh, in the medium and long term. Eurobuck represents uh, a great opportunity to experiment public policy interventions model uh, with the European cities that share the same values uh, and deal with the same challenges. It's a source of wealth, inspiration, and experimentation. And uh, in my opinion, it's the image of a concrete Europe close to its citizens. Now, Daniele, how is it possible to bring Europe closer to its citizens? Uh, well, I have a further consideration. Um, today, it can be difficult to not as create uh, value for a local administration as to make it uh, recognizable and share with uh, both citizens uh, and the uh, stakeholder. Uh, as inspired by the right to the city of the urban agenda, uh, creating trust among people to change the collective perception of uh, historical and urban centers uh, is a political and cultural operation that a participatory process can help to relaunch. Uh, this is the massive challenge that I try to carry out every day focusing on what I usually call human regeneration. I also strongly believe that uh, sometimes uh, it's easier to focus attention on this issue in small towns uh, where social cohesion is stronger and the action of a local government can be more incisive. 
At the same time, uh, there are many difficulties that hinder European action in the small and medium-sized municipality of Europe. Many administration, I think, needs an adequate reinforcement of the internal skills uh, of the administrative machinery. I'm ready, for sure, to do my part and to talk about it uh, with uh, those who are interested in contact with me. Uh, but at the same time, I have a question for you. Can we, as my, uh, mayor of smaller towns, have a better opportunity and role to play compared to the past in the new programming phase? Well, thank you for listening and enjoy this afternoon. Thank you very much, Daniela. Mariam, back to you and the guests. Thank you, Betsy and Alejandra. No, Ms. Salvez, I'm going to come to you. Let's pick up on, on what we just heard there. So can small towns uh, really expect to have this bigger role, perhaps, uh, in the new programming phase compared to, for example, the past? Yes, I will try and respond to this uh, question directly. It depends on the regions, it depends on the territory. But of course, in, it is in everyone's interest to strive towards this. We already know in local authorities, and we've seen it even more during the current health crisis, there's an awful lot of expertise in our local areas. And we need to consult them, we need to associate them in local governance, in partnerships. And if we don't do that, we lose out on their expertise. So it is important that we should strive to this. Uh, uh, globalization is a good thing. If I look at my territory, my département, uh, we uh, in fact, uh, have been working on insertion policies uh, under the European Social Fund. It doesn't matter where we are in Paris, but we all work together. And in fact, we had proposed to our local government that we should work together, joint work between the different regions and the towns uh, responsible for employment to create uh, uh, services for our citizens using our expertise and I think that's the sort of thing we need to do to build up everyone should be involved uh, it's in the interest of uh, everyone now the uh, public services can uh, make certain proposals to our citizens. It'll bring them closer to what the European Union is doing, but also it'll help us uh, stamp out inequalities, uh, to phase out inequalities. Uh, but our main uh, action should be to stop inequalities uh, being created in the first place. So we need to consult the uh, various local authorities, uh, involve them in partnerships. And we've seen uh, that we it'll take, take some time, but we really need to involve the local authorities. Recovery plan for EU territories. Ce sont des fonds extrêmement importants. These are extremely important funds. And I think the recovery plan gives an opportunity and a rare op opportunity added to the structural funds to make progress everywhere. Having said that, I think we have to keep saying to the member states that there are a number of principles which are obligatory and has been reminded that we've been reminded at a European level there is a deficit in terms of a, a territorial approach to recovery. The territoriality of the recovery plan is absolutely essential if we want to retain the principles that underlie recovery. And in the recovery plan, you have a significant share which uh, is linked to subsidies and loans, and states shouldn't lose sight of that. And the other thing that we need to keep in mind is that the recovery plan 
when it comes to subsidies, I think 390 million is almost completely, uh, corresponds almost entirely to the cohesion funding. So this is an opportunity, but it's also a significant risk that you destabilize the principles and the rules of cohesion. Because what we want to stop is to have these breaks in terms of territory. And if you've got so-and-so billions, uh, millions which are not focused on that objective and will simply lead to increased gulfs between different areas, then we've got a bigger problem tomorrow. So the Commission, the Parliament, the Committee of the Regions need to work together to correct that wherever it may occur. But what I want to say is that the European Parliament would be very attentive to the monitoring and the follow-up and the implementation of all these funds. We've shouldered our responsibilities as co-legislators in terms of defining all these regulations. But the work of the Parliament is not finished because the Parliament also has responsibility for the for monitoring the implementation. And all the different committees are determined to do that. So when it comes to the recovery plan, it seems to me that it can be a huge opportunity. But if we're not careful, it could also upset a number of the objectives that we're wedded to. So to sum up, what I'm trying to say is that the structural funds really made it possible to construct Europe. And at this time of crisis, which strikes the whole of Europe, we've seen the value of the cohesion policies and the structural funds, which will make it possible to reconstruct Europe. This is our historical responsibility. When we started this term in office, we didn't think that we would be overtaken by history, but this is a historical moment for the European Union and for the regional policy. Thank you. Uh, right. Well, it's now time for our next uh, video, and we're going over to Bratislava, where we met uh, the President of Bratislava and member of the European Committee of the Regions. In this video, you're going to find out how EU cohesion funds have really supported structural challenges. Take a look. The pandemic is with us and will be with us. My task as a politician is to give people perspective and give people a positive future. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to answer the questions. Uh, I represent the Bratislava metropolitan region, and it's a region that I was born in, I'm very proud of, and I'm working for. Due to high immigration into Bratislava region, we are lacking the buildings for schools, we are lacking the facilities for children's sports, and we have several other challenges, but if I should sum it up, it's the environment, it's the quality of life, it's the social services for the aging population, and uh, most importantly, it's the education. And this is somewhere where I'm hoping that the European uh, Union will be able to help us, despite the fact that on the paper and in the statistics, we look like a wealthy region. People actually discovered that their, uh, their relationship with the nature and many people at the time of the greatest despair uh, found a way to go back to the forest, spend time in the nature. My predecessor opened up in the year 2012 the so-called uh, uh, Liberty Bridge or Bridge of Freedom. 
And this is a bridge across the Morava River, which is uh, connecting or dividing Austria and Slovakia. Now we are going to open a new bridge, which is approximately uh, 20 kilometers away. Uh, it's built for the bikers, which are numerous in Lower Austria as well as in Bratislava region. Uh, but uh, the bridge will also fulfill the function of the emergency road in case of a greater fire or the need for medical services. An ambulance car or a smaller fire truck can cross the bridge as well. Another great video there. Well, now it's time to go back to our social media experts, to Betty and Alejandro, guys. Thank you, Mariam. We are happy to report that the EU region's big hashtag has been mentioned over 700 times already across social media platforms, and that's just today, so please keep it going, guys. And speaking of hashtags and cohesion, have you ever heard of the Cohesion Alliance? I've heard something, but perhaps we could uh, tell more about it. In 2017, the European Committee of the Regions, together with re leading associations of European regions and cities, launched the Alliance, and strong cohesion and cross-border cooperations are among its goals. So, if this topic is close to your heart, it is yet another hashtag to keep uh, following and trending. That's right. So, once again, don't forget to go in the live chat of the event platform on Facebook and on Twitter. Back to you, Mariam. Thank you, Betty and Alejandro. And of course, don't forget to use that, that hashtag because they are waiting for all of your tweets. OK, so President Diti Costas, uh, lots of facts and figures there, which uh, on Cajun policy, and since you, of course, are the president of the European Committee of the Regions, it's time for you to break all of this down for us. So what is really the importance uh, of cohesion policy? How has it really made a difference to people's lives in cities and perhaps in villages, especially uh, since this pandemic? Well, <coughs> cohesion uh, policy funds are of key importance for Europe. And I will explain to you very simply. You know, today in most regions and cities all across Europe, it is thanks to the cohesion funds that we make roads, we make hospitals, we make schools, we tackle the environmental crisis, we move on with digitalization, we support our SMEs and our local economies and uh, the people who are most in need. So cohesion funds are in our everyday life and they change everyday life of ordinary citizens. So uh, you know that uh, aside from all of that, the cohesion funds were used during the pandemic and during this crisis also because we were able to reallocate this money and support our hospitals, uh, hire some more nurses, doctors, uh, medical equipment and this thanks to the Commission and thanks to Commissioner Ferreira who was very quick in responding to this emergency and we managed to use these cohesion funds in order to tackle the, the pandemic. But you know, cohesion is not only about money. Cohesion is a fundamental principle for European Union and European citizens. For example, the vaccination process that is undergoing now is a great example of cohesion. Uh, of how Europe does not allow regions, poorer regions, to stay behind. But we all move forward together in tackling this pandemic. So we were the first, the Committee of Regions were the first to uh, say that we needed not to reduce the cohesion funds in these new programs, in, in these uh, new budgets. And it is good that finally, after a lot of discussion and debate, we manage not to reduce these funds. And uh, it is of great importance the fact that today, Europe, regions, cities are a key partner into making cohesion policy a reality in every village, city, and region in Europe. Thank you so much, President Tsitsikas. And I think lots of people watching will be really uh, you know, interested in, in, in what you said and how you summed up what cohesion policy uh, is really all about. Well, time now to go to our second theme, and it's taking us green. Yes, I did just try to rhyme that. Um, Europe is, of course, striving to be the first uh, carbon-neutral continent with zero net emissions by 2050. <laughs> Thank you. 
EU regions need to take control of their own digitalization and sustainability, so says Jeanette Balieu. Now, she's a member of the Committee of the Regions living over in Rotterdam. Get ready to find out how cities and regions have really invested during this pandemic to increase sustainability using, of course, European structural funds. And here's something for you. Do you want to know what selective plastic extraction is? Commissioner, do you know? You probably might let us know. Well, watch this video. European regions need to take ownership on the digital and green transition and the cross-border clusters to recover from the pandemic. I'm very uh, pleased to be here, although it's digital, but uh, at this opening uh, week for the uh, European Week of Regions and Cities. And I'm looking forward uh, to a fruitful discussions, uh, fruitful meetings. And I'm very pleased that I can say something about uh, industry policy and especially one of the projects, Oboto. In the Obotech uh, project, it is, it is an amazing technology that has been used and uh, we call it selective plastic extraction, uh, which is a difficult phrase, but it is, uh, it is, what, is uh, what is is mentioned. And it brings back the waste plastics to the virtual material. And that is very innovative. Uh, we, we, we reuse plastics, that is what we do already, but we now bring it even back to the virginal uh, material and that is, that is a step further. And um, this is so important for, uh, first of all, of course, recycling, but second of all, becoming less dependent on new fossil fuels. So if we can bring it back to the virtual, virgin material, uh, this is an important step for us. European funds are very important to come back from this uh, pandemic and for the recovery. We have seen in our province the economy shrank by 2.3%. And of course, in many other regions uh, in Europe, uh, it is even higher. So it's very important that we come out strongly. And therefore, we need to immediately also invest in the change, in the transitions, uh, and get our industry stronger back from this pandemic. It is also very important for us as regions that we secure the jobs that we have. It will be new jobs. But it cannot only come from new industries. We also have to make the change in the industries that there are now, and especially the SMEs, to get make the next steps in the transition. If it is because we want the green transition, but also the digital transition, there's a lot of digital divide between companies for those who can make it and those who cannot make it. So reduce, reuse, recycle, these are, the, you could say, the general principles or the ethos behind a circular economy. Now, Commissioner Ferreira, how is European cohesion policy really contributing to, you could say, the sustainable transition? Well, in fact, when we are talking about recovery, we are uh, trying to stimulate the coming back better. And one of the elements that we cannot ignore, but uh, on the opposite, has got to be at, at the center of our new agenda, is climate, environment. We just saw it. This summer was really, a, it was not new, but it was a big reminder of a big alert. We are in an emergency situation. So this is the reason why 30% of the funds uh, are of cohesion. They are directed. Uh, in fact, towards greening. And uh, all the projects that, are, that, that will take place, uh, they, they have got to abide by a principle that is do no harm to the environment. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I would combine it with another do no harm, do no harm to cohesion. And so <laughs> probably these two uh, elements are at the core have got to be at the core of our agenda. Because sustainability also requires that uh, you retain people and activities and employment and jobs for young people. 
in other places apart from the big towns uh, because in fact uh, big towns are suffering from congestion already and we are suffering all over Europe of a massive brain drain because uh, when there is a crisis imbalances increase poverty increases and so if we don't want to have a fragmented society and a fragmented economy we have got to be very attentive to these aspects my last comment relates to the support that we are in fact organizing and uh, all these initiatives people were kind to, to refer to the commission commission took the initiative but we had to count on a very active support from the European Parliament, from the governments, from the Committee of Regions, from the Economic and Social Committee. So there was a movement and we cannot stop this movement. And we have got to keep our vision correct. For this, we have got all this support to build back better. We have launched uh, an interesting initiative, it's Bauhaus. The Bauhaus project <laughs> is something that is uh, bringing yes. in a lot of young people, uh, build back beautiful, build back uh, in a sustainable manner and in a solidarity manner, in a, a manner that can be shared by everybody. But very specific funds for its Just Transition Fund is directed towards support to very specific regions where the transition is particularly difficult and can trigger a lot of social and regional instability. And so to minimize this transition to the impact on the economy and on the society of this transition, particularly on jobs, uh, we have specific funding for this. So yes, let's build back better, but for this let's work together on a vision, a common vision that is not just a general vision, but that is narrowed down to the level of having development strategies for the regions, for groups of municipalities, so that uh, we use the funds in the best possible way in order to rebalance socially and territorially our growth. With uh, quality growth, quality growth requires uh, a more balanced growth. And this is one of the lessons that we can take from our past experience. Lovely, and I'm glad that you said build back beautiful. That's a lovely, <laughs> lovely phrase there. And so the European Green Deal is, of course, if you haven't heard about it, you really should know what it is. It's really been hailed as, you could say, the lifeline that's going to get us all out of this COVID-19 pandemic. So in that vein, how are local and regional authorities contributing to the green transition and, of course, this sustainable recovery? Well, taking a look at this project from this French city of Grenoble. Uh, Grenoble is also Europe's 2022 Green Capital. It is important to get citizens to understand uh, that life tomorrow will be different and should also be better. Hello, my name is Klaus Hartfast. I'm a city councillor from Grenoble. I'm very happy to be with you uh, via video from Grenoble. And uh, of course, uh, we here in Grenoble, uh, as a city in the heart of the French Alps, uh, are very pleased to be a front runner in the green transition. And I very much hope also that we will be able very shortly uh, in the future to discuss directly and not only via video, how together to make the green transition uh, uh, even faster and even more efficient. And this cannot come top down. This has to be developed uh, in a both top down, but also in a bottom up approach, because the city of tomorrow can only be built with the citizens together and not by designers or architects alone. The models from the 1960s and 70s have not all, but to a large extent failed. As climate change became reality, it was obvious that Grenoble was among the front runners to adapt to climate change. To adapt to climate change, but also to initiate actions to reduce its CO2 emission.
And there indeed cohesion funds are very important. Uh, we have, for example, uh, received cohesion funds for a large um, heating facility. We have France's the second biggest uh, urban heating network. And we have uh, um, stopped a fuel run uh, heating facility and replaced it by wood uh, cogeneration co facility that received cohesion funds. Cohesion funds are also very important for mobility. We would like to use methanization of waste in order to, uh, to, to power our buses. All this is economically not viable without the contribution from the cohesion fund. Grenoble was ahead in the French Revolution, and we very much would like to be ahead also in the green transition in France and in Europe. Okay, so over a period of 10 years, uh, Grenoble reduced its overall greenhouse gas emissions by a staggering 25%. That's pretty impressive. Well, let's now go over to our audience, uh, where we have Mr. Gabe Ledvich, a member of the European Committee of the Regions and president uh, of West Pomerania in Poland, who is standing by I hear. Now, you want to talk about Grenoble, uh, and you've said that it's given you food for thought, I hear. I think that uh, what we've shown uh, in Grenoble was not only interesting but very inspiring and very ambitious. And I fully agree that if we want to be successful uh, in this green revolution, we have to be uh, we have to be uh, efficient at all level. This European uh, who support us with the funds is national with a good sometimes uh, a legal solution, for example. But we have to take our citizens on board, and it is uh, crucial for me. Okay. Um, and so a second follow-up question, perhaps, Mr. Glebevic. Uh, Grenoble couldn't have made this transition, the sustainable transition, of course, without EU cohesion funds. So how are EU cohesion funds being used uh, in the green to help speed up, especially the green transition in West Pomerania? You know, the, these ambitious goals uh, in the Green uh, Deal are not only extremely important for West Pomerania region, but it is completely in, in line of our uh, vision of development of, of our uh, region. We are a relatively big region in Poland, uh, 23,000 of uh, square hectares, 35% uh, covered by beautiful forest, 180 kilometers of a beautiful uh, seashore, a lot of lakes, a lot of rivers, and we have to protect it for our kids. Uh, so, of course, in our strategy adopted in 2019, we uh, put the uh, green growth in the central place. Uh, I have to admit that a lot of uh, work was done in my region. In my region, uh, we are producing more than 20% percent of uh, Polish green energy and it covers some more than 70 percent of our uh, consumption uh, we we uh, in uh, we uh, implemented uh, more than 1500 uh, environmental programs in my region uh, recently starting from big, big uh, the, the programs in the public transport, for example, in the capital city, but, uh, but ending with a very small uh, wastewater treatment plant in the, in the small, small villages. I think that if we want to be successful, we uh, have to go farther. Right now, we have huge challenges in our cities. Uh, in Poland, for example, uh, connected with the air quality. We have to replace a lot of uh, very uh, old, oh, maybe old type uh, heat resources ba ba based on coil uh, to clean up our air. We have to green our cities uh, if we want to uh, have a green lungs in our cities. And I think that our citizens fully deserve that. And I think that we have to make our cities even more blue. Uh, just to good wa water management, uh, we, sh we should collect uh, rainwater and use it to green our cities. So we have a lot of infrastru uh, infrastructural challenges. But on the other hand, I think that it is crucial uh, to 
remember about this social dimension of the, of the problem. So if we want to be successful finally, we have to do, do all our actions not for the people, but with the people. Yeah. So we have to have youngsters on board as well as seniors on board. We have to have citizens in, of a city, of a cities on board, and uh, the, the citizens in the countryside as well. And uh, I think that it is our common challenge, common responsibility, and common task for the uh, next generations. Okay, well, thank you so much for that. Uh, let's now go over to the Irish coastal town of Dunleary, uh, where Committee of the Regions member Una Power, who's also a county councillor, uh, tells us about their summer streets programme. That's basically kicking out the gas guzzlers from city centres. Take a look. I'm so excited to talk to you about our Summer Streets programme in Dunleary Rathdown County Council in Dublin in Ireland. Um, I think it's a very important way of framing the discussion on how we can have a green recovery for our regions and cities in a post-pandemic world. And it's been fantastic so far. It's really kind of brought a renewed energy to the village. Basically, where it has been pedestrianized, we have worked with the businesses in the area to make sure that we are facilitating their needs. And we ran a consultation prior to it. Over the course of it being pedestrianized, we are collecting data in terms of footfall to shops. as a member of the Committee of the Regions, we have a really important voice because we're there at the forefront of the local and regional um, economies and communities. For us, everything isn't abstract. It's very much tangible. It's on the ground. We are the ones implementing the policies. So our voices are, they need to be there at every level if anything is to succeed. Um, because all of the ambitions come down to all of the people working together. We really need to go for a green economy. Um, we don't even need to go for it, we have to go for it from an environmental point of view, for the future of the planet and the well-being of the people um, living on it. It's not going to be easy though, because it will take a lot of changes in how we conduct ourselves and our businesses and our economies. But I think coming out of the pandemic, there's such a want to work locally and invest locally and live locally. And this is going to take a lot from all of our governments to make sure that there's adequate housing in our areas, that there's adequate transport options outside of the private car in our areas to get to our towns, villages, to get to our economic hubs. And I think this is something the EU has to work on um, and I hope we work on and it's something I'm sure I'll definitely be advocating for uh, and my team will be advocating for. Um, and I think it's it's there across the board, um, but it won't it won't be without challenges. It's a the scope of this is huge. So pedestrianisation really helping to lo to help local businesses thrive there, which is always a great approach. Well, it's time now to launch our third and final discussion.
Okay, so this is our third and final discussion of this opening uh, ceremony. And the theme is, of course, digital transition and citizen engagement within the framework of the Conference on the Future of Europe. So that's obviously a little bit of a mouthful, so let me break it down. Uh, the Conference on the Future of Europe gives EU citizens the chance to debate Europe's challenges and priorities. And then all EU institutions here your recommendations and they then present them back to you uh, by spring 2022. Think about it this way, it's a citizen's initiative to really create an action plan for Europe, so that can only be a good thing. And part of the action plan is of course digitalization. If the pandemic has really showed all of us one thing, it's that we really need to do, we really need to get on the front foot when it comes to uh, innovation. Well, over now to Helsinki in Finland, where a large part of their recovery plan is based on digital solutions with citizen participation. Take a look. I feel that we will fail in digitalization if we do not utilize the data in our citizens' terms. I want to thank you to be able to participate in the opening session of European Week of Regions and Cities. And I'm very happy to tell like how the city can improve their services and help citizens under COVID-19 and use the digitalization more and more. We can use like the artificial intelligence, data analytics, and so on much more than other cities because we have a lot of data. The COVID-19 has accelerated the digitalization of city very, very fast. We have to find very, very quick solutions, how we are collecting data, how we are using. And now we have new cases that challenge the thinking. So it has very much changed the thinking and at the speed of digitalization. We need very quick data-driven decision-making. We need to utilize the data more, but also at the same time when we are talking about COVID-19, we have to share the data for businesses and utilization of also external resources. When we are talking about AI and data analytics, it's, it's something that needs to be done with the citizens that we can keep the trust. Chatbots, for example, have been helping to give information for our citizens. When they have had questions about COVID-19, even though they haven't able to be met city workers, the chatbots have been very helpful to give the information. We have to help the digitalization in every country in Europe. We need to build the future together. It's very important to provide all the cities and regions different kind of ways to solve their problem. So we saw there chatbots really helping people during the pandemic, and that's such a simple thing. You know, during this pandemic, of course, everyone needed someone to talk to because we were so isolated. And I mean, I can tell you my own personal story is that I suddenly made friends with all of my neighbours, um, obviously socially distanced, having all of these chats. How about for either of you? President Tsitsikosas, perhaps you could go yeah. first. Well, it was a difficult period. Yeah. I mean, there is no doubt about this. But on the other hand, you know, it was a period that we had the chance to see what the problems of our communications were so far and how, for example, the digital gap needs to close because we saw during the pandemic that uh, uh, with the digital gap we had a problem between the rural and the urban areas. They had totally different yes. uh, ways of working because, you know, during this pandemic we had the opportunity to exchange ideas I had as governor of Central Macedonia and my city Thessaloniki I had the opportunity to discuss with the citizens through the social media, through the internet, and uh, basically come to decide on policies that affected uh, the citizens, but with their involvement, not without. So yes, indeed, it was difficult because interpersonal uh, relations were cut off, but yes. we were able to communicate and to find solutions. 
Uh, this yeah. was not the case with many regions and cities across Europe where the digital divide is bigger and where internet is not existent in the percentages that exist in other regions. And that's exactly where we need to work now because in these areas there were problems with education, there were problems with the SMEs, the businesses, problems with the, the, the workers. So we need to see what lessons we have learned from this pandemic and make sure that we will tackle them in uh, the process of the recovery. Lovely. Well, definitely, uh, you know, this pandemic was a new way of living. Um, have you gotten used to using Teams and all of these other virtual ways of, of, of communicating and, and speaking online to yeah. friends and colleagues? Well, it is true, but we were work working extremely hard throughout because everything that we are now uh, talking about, they had to be, the legislation had to be changed. Uh, communication had got uh, had got to, to to reach the the member states the region so we were working extremely hard uh, one one lesson is that uh, in fact we were traveling too much before because we managed to do yes. a lot of things without polluting so much without having so many emissions but on the other hand we missed each other Mm. Uh, I would like to, to, to note a second aspect uh, that is following exactly on what President Tsikost has mentioned, because in fact we are anchoring everything on the potential of the digital network, but we have got to make sure that we don't create yet another divide across Europe, the digital divide. Mm. Because uh, uh, as we are anchoring uh, public services in the digital framework, as we are betting on, on, on digital uh, capacities, uh, we have got to make sure that we don't leave people and uh, territories behind because they don't have the infrastructure or because they don't have the capabilities. So uh, digital as well as innovation and things come together, uh, and we saw some examples in the last videos uh, coming uh, in particular from developed regions of Europe in which you have uh, the capacity and this is what funds should be doing for the most developed areas, even in countries that still have to catch up, like Slovakia and you are uh, showing Bratislava. Okay, let's look at the rest of the countries. Uh, let's look at the rest of the regions and let's take these examples, these uh, forward looking examples, like the Rotterdam project in which you mix a circular economy, like uh, the, uh, the last example that we had in which we could see how artificial intelligence could be applied in a better management, for instance, of transport, how we can shift, how we can transpose these innovative ways that usually come from the top centers into not so big, not so powerful areas, so that in fact mid-sized mid towns and remote areas can also participate from this innovation with the adequate adaptabilities and use these new technologies as a reason and a stimulus to growth and to retain their own youth uh, in new activities uh, because the final comment that I'd like to make is that there is now a huge opportunity for activities, for businesses, for people to work and to work to be part of the network. They don't have necessarily to come and to increase the agglomeration problems of the big cities of Europe that in fact are fighting to cope and to keep this capacity to, to grow in an intelligent way when they are faced every day with people that are with brain drain and with people that are rejected from the territories where they were born and forced to move forward uh, to come to the, to the surrounding areas of big cities. So rebalancing the growth and rebalancing the use of these powerful technologies is in itself also a challenge for all of us. Yeah, no, definitely it's a challenge and great <laughs> comments there from both the President uh, and uh, Ms. Commissioner. Now let's go to uh, our studio audience and see what they uh, can contribute to the conversation. And to Kieran McCarthy, a uh, member of the European Committee of the Regions and also a member of Cork City Council uh, in Ireland. Uh, Kieran, you wanted also to comment on this initiative in Helsinki. What did you think about it? I mean, I, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I mean, it is a really great best practice example of EU e government 
in action and the importance of a digital local authority plan, plus the use of data um, and sensors, and also to that point of future-proofing um, our public services, that COVID has changed the way we look at cities, um, and there is this, this real need that we need to move forward with the digital transition. Okay, and so, you know, building upon that, do you think that in Northern Europe there's perhaps a lag, or is it doing well in its efforts to go digital? I think the bottle is half full. I think there are opportunities there. Um, don't get me wrong, there are challenges. Uh, yeah. I mean, your, your guest mentioned the challenges in terms of disparities, the digital divide. The dig digital divide is very much present uh, between rural areas and urban areas. Uh, and also with disparities, you're also talking about comp competitiveness uh, and financial investors. Investors want to invest in areas where they want to get their money back, not, pati not particularly in um, a rural area. Uh, there's also the challenge of, we say, synergies within local authority areas. Some um, local government bodies are very good at building ecosystems and working together. Working together, Others aren't. And then there's also the issue of broadband. Um, like, we, we, you, you, we get very... Uh, we get very good broadband in some local authorities, local authority areas, and other areas then we don't. Uh, and then some in local authority areas or some broadband investors say that 2G, t 2G, 2G technology is okay, where it's not, where we need 5G and more for, for the future. And then my, my fourth, I suppose the fourth challenge that I wish to, wish to mention is kind of education and skills. Um, that very much going forward, we need to fill probably 800,000 uh, positions to do with the ICT sector and um, we need to put a focus on that and keep a focus on that for the future. Um, and there are other challenges, but they, they are the four that actually come to mind. Thank you, Kieran. And especially, you know, also for engaging uh, with this uh, digital agenda. And just to, of course, remind everyone as well, uh, the European Commission has, of course, proposed a path uh, to the digital decade, a concrete plan to achieve a digital transformation by 2030. The proposed path to the digital decade will translate the EU's digital ambitions for 2030 into a concrete delivery mechanism. Well, over now to Betty and Alejandro for some more social media updates. Guys, we've been missing you. Thank you very much. We are very excited to share with you that the EU Regions Week hashtag is now number two trending in Belgium. So thank you very much for joining the conversation and let's push it even more. Um, and uh, let's not please forget that the comment sections in the st of the streams on Facebook and Twitter, as well as on the events platform, are there for the viewers to share their views and opinions. That's right, and speaking of the digital age, the European Committee of the Regions have created a survey on the future of Europe. The idea is to find out what people think of the European Union, where it's going, future challenges, and the role. Of course, the survey is available in all EU languages, and it's completely anonymous. So you can go and check it out at cor.europa.eu slash futuresurvey.go. Thank you, and back to you, Mariam. Thank you, Betty and Alejandro, and back to us open, to our co-hosts. Uh, so, um, we've been talking about the Conference on the Future of Europe, this Action Plan for Europe, uh, which is, of course, made up of the ideas and initiatives and contributions by EU citizens themselves. And since uh, it was launched, to date, there are 115,000 participants. So, thank you, of course, for taking part in that. President Tsitsikosas, coming to you first, what is your sort of real or tangible expectation when it comes to the process of the conference uh, on the future of Europe? Well, I personally have very high expectations because I feel that it's a unique opportunity for Europe to make some profound changes. We now have seen what uh, our problems were and uh, where Europe needs to change in order to address these issues. And in my opinion, we need now to move to a new democratic model or strengthen, if you want, the democratic model that we have today. Um, uh, you know, uh, if we want to accomplish uh, all these targets that we have set, if we want to tackle the crisis and uh, uh, the problems that exist all across Europe in the 300 regions and the 90,000 municipalities of Europe and in the 27 member states, then we need to change our approach. Uh, in my opinion, the two-dimensional Europe has reached it li its limits, EU and member states. We need now to move to a three-dimensional approach for Europe in its democratic model of working, involving the European Union, the member states, of course, and the regions and the cities. You know, it's, as I said earlier today in our conference with Commissioner Ferreira, it's like a house where you have the walls being the member states, the 
proof, which would be the European Union, but you need also to have the foundations, strong foundations, which would be the regions and the cities. So I believe that it's a unique opportunity. The European Union should not miss this opportunity. We are not looking at another beauty contest between the institutions. <laughs> it is a great opportunity for Europe to start uh, speaking with the people instead of speaking at the mirror to herself. We need to engage the citizens and the actors who can engage the citizens more than anyone else are the cities and the regions. And that's why we're organizing local dialogues all across Europe to bring together the citizens, hear their concerns, their ideas. Uh, because you know, Maya, we need to face it. Today, Europe has a lot of crises around. And if we want to strengthen our house, our common house, is not with less Europe, it's with more Europe, but with more democratic Europe where all citizens will not feel left out of the decision-making process. So we need to bring Europe closer to the citizens and the citizens themselves to feel part of this great effort that is happening in our continent. So we, regions and cities, feel that we can help provide this result, uh, even though today we really believe that there is a lot of work that needs to be done. In our uh, barometer that we will present tomorrow, 65% of uh, locally and regionally elected politicians feel that they do not have enough influence in EU's future. And at the same time, nine out of 10 want a stronger involvement in the EU decision-making process. So let's make this a reality. And I really believe that if this is the case, that we will manage to have a stronger Europe that will be working for the people, but with the people. Okay, lovely. Uh, and I'd like to point there about uh, EU institutions uh, shouldn't be having a beauty contest. That's so true. Uh, so, Commissioner Ferreira, what about regions and cities then? Uh, how should or should they contribute to the Conference on the Future of Europe? Well, in fact, um, I think uh, the, the conference will, I mean, politically, is a moment where uh, European institutions, and I agree, no beauty <laughs> contest, but uh, the you European well, institutions yeah. uh, approach the people. And they, 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 that's the sense of the initiative. Okay, what do you want? Uh, what do, how how to, 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 to relate in, to individual citizens. And I think there is no better way to address it than through cohesion policy, because this is, as we have proven, and it became extremely clear and evident during the crisis, yeah. that in fact, people want to have a say, people want to be closer, but for this, we have got to give the space for them to speak up and to engage. So through the cohesion policy and the, the instruments of cohesion policy, we have created the mechanisms to do it. But it is also important that uh, rebalancing growth is truly considered uh, a new paradigm, a new objective for Europe. Because we saw it, in the, even from a, a political point of view, uh, engaging with Europe requires, uh, I mean, uh, bringing forward the core values of Europe. I mean, solidarity is among the most relevant ones, respect for the others, respect for diversity. So probably what we need to do is to go back to basics and to bring forward uh, all the, the essential elements on which uh, this, this incredible project uh, that is uh, European integration and European Union was built on. And this requires to listen to the people, even when these people are in remote areas, in mid-sized towns, and to give all people a chance to be part of the overall welfare. So I think this kind of concept has got to be at the center of this, uh, of this incredible initiative. And I think that having a network like this network that we are working with, with more than 300 regions. Uh, some are richer, some are poorer, and adapting the policies to the characteristics of each of them. And bearing in mind that cohesion policy is, exists to support basically those that cannot help themselves, 
uh, that doesn't mean excluding the most dynamic ones, but it's asking more from support when support is given to a more dynamic area and making a kind of a network that brings everybody together in a much more balanced and much more sustainable, by definition, future, with also our new priorities at the center. And this is being digital, being environmental, being green, and being uh, cohesive regionally and socially. <laughs> So I think this is the message that we have got to put at the center of this, of this new initiative to, to revisit Europe and its relationship uh, with the, between the institutions and citizens. Lovely. So great comments there from both the President uh, and Commissioner. Telling all of you to get involved, uh, of course, with this process. Well, let me now hand over back to Betty and Alejandro, who are going to tell us more about the European Youth Forum and the European Youth Event. Guys? Thanks, Mariam. Indeed, we have now together here with us two young guests. And the first one is Celia Marcula, president of the European Youth Forum. Hi, Celia. Welcome. Hello, hello. Good to be here. Hi, how are you? I'm great, thanks. Well, we're happy to have you today here. So, Celia, the Conference on the Future of Europe, how do you welcome it? Well, we at the European Youth Forum are, of course, very uh, excited about an opportunity like this. We're the largest platform of youth organizations in the world, and we see this as a as quite a unique moment in history uh, where we are really asked to contribute and, and give our, our thoughts on what Europe could or should look like in the future. Now, I represent uh, a generation that is very often forgotten or, or left behind. Uh, sometimes even in pointed fingers at, like we saw with the pandemic, uh, where we were basically seen as the scapegoats uh, to be blamed for uh, for all of this, uh, so seen as culprits rather than uh, the ones who really were disproportionately hit by the pandemic and, and the ones contributing in solving it. So I hope this, this time with the conference, uh, we won't be let down and remain unheard. Uh, we, of course, uh, need some really tangible outcomes and, and commitment from the institutions to commit to those outcomes uh, to improve the lives of my generation. That really is, is how I would uh, welcome the, the conference. And that would be my brief con contribution to this. Thank you. Thank you. And could you tell us, in your view, uh, what does a successful conference look like for the European Youth Forum and for the young generation? We, of course, want to see young people uh, at the heart of this process. Uh, young people, we have a really a huge stake in those discussions and the decisions that then hopefully will uh, dictate the course uh, of the next future of, of the Union. And uh, I really want to see policymakers and, and decision makers in the EU to take youth participation seriously in, in this context and make it really wide at the EU level also beyond the lifetime uh, of this conference, so not just during, but also after the conference, to see that uh, my generation is, is also heard uh, beyond just the youth, usual traditional youth topics, but also, uh, also wide and beyond, because all topics really uh, touch also our lives. So that's really what, what I would like to see. And of course, uh, today we're here with cities and regions, and I know many of you uh, have an important role in, in contributing to that on a very local level. And I think that's really where all of this starts. Uh, the European youth capitals, for instance, are an example of cities that really are taking young people seriously. And I think Absolutely. those are the kinds of solutions that, that we want to see uh, across this process. Absolutely. Now, of course, the conference can't uh, simply be a nice exercise in itself with no consequences. As I mentioned earlier, we would like to see a binding mechanism that ensures that the institutions actually uh, follow up on the ideas that come from the process and uh, as an outcome. Uh, we, as the Youth Forum, would like to see uh, some solutions when it comes to education, uh, young people's transition from education to employment, uh, social systems that uh, don't discriminate against uh, young people simply because they're young or because of their age or life situation, uh, like they do right now. Uh, we'd like uh, to ensure that young people can contribute in our societies uh, more so than, than we can right now, for instance, by lowering the voting age to 16. Uh, we really want to uh, to be heard in, in our societies, just like everybody else. So instead of becoming this, this lost generation that we, we threat becoming, I think uh, this is an opportunity for us to, to hopefully put more emphasis on, on youth rights. Because without that, without this focus on youth, uh, we'll never really truly, truly have a, 
uh, a strong or a lasting uh, connected European society. Well, thank you and have a great afternoon. So we're back to you, Maria. Thank you, Alejandro and Betty. Uh, maybe uh, our guests uh, have something to say on what they've just heard there. Um, if we can, uh, let's now go to our live studio audience, our COVID safe studio audience, um, and to the first vice president of the European Committee uh, of the Regions, Vasco Alves Cordero. Uh, Mr. Cordero, you've heard uh, what the young leaders had to say there. Are European leaders really ready to hear what young people have to say? Well, first of all, let me express how exciting it is to be here in this opening session of the European Week of Regions and Cities. And I think there is a very uh, happy uh, formula to link the youth event with the Conference on the Future of Europe, because um, that's what we're talking about not only about the procedure to listen to citizens, to listen to young people, but also about substance. This link exists also from the substance point of view, because you are asking people and youth has all the interest to be part of this process. What are the main politics that concerns to them and they think the European Union should address in the future? So this is of a quite relevance, but also I think this is a very important exercise of information, of people knowing that you don't only have a bright side, there is the need to make options. And to be part of the European Union is to be part of this project as a whole, not only from the good part, the from the funds part. No, it's a question of commitment with this idea of solidarity, of building something that relates us all European. The conference on the future of Europe is about us. It's not about a Europe uh, a la carte. It's about how we can strengthen, how we can fortify this project. But also this um, this initiative, this endeavor of the Conference on the Future of Europe has some demands, has some risks, if you want to put it this way. This is a matter of trust. You cannot ask people, you cannot ask youth, come, say what you want, say what you want for the future, and then when the conference ends, thank you for your participation, we have we're going to have business as usual. No, that would be damaging, not only for the trust that we are asking for, but also for the European institutions. But it is also a question of accountability. What the European institutions are prepared to do with the results of this consultation. So this is very exciting because it's a, a redefining moment about Europe and about the European Union, but it has and it should be addressed as a complex process that demands from everyone, not only from the citizens, but also from their representatives at local and regional level, at national level, at European level, and the European institutions, a high degree of awareness of what is at stake in this process. But you know, I have faith that this is going to be a very successful process. Well, let's hope that it is. Okay, well, thousands, of course, of young people shared their ideas about the future of Europe. And we have this uh, short video. Take a look.
Dan, you saw there the I event 2021, and of course, uh, Commissioner Ferrer, you would know the, the the Strasbourg Parliament very well, no? Oh, very well. <laughs> it's a beautiful well building. <laughs> it's beautiful. It is. Okay. But it's even more beautiful with all these young people there. <laughs> Fantastic, especially of course after this yeah. pandemic. Um, okay, well, before uh, we. Uh, talk again, uh, Commissioner. Let's now give the floor to another member of our audience, uh, a member of the Committee of the Regions, perhaps. Um, do we have a Mr. Spike? Yes, here I am. Perfect. Well, the conference on the future of Europe really is an opportunity for European democracy, and I think President Sassoli has made that very clear in his initial statement. But it's also a test bed for participatory instruments to enhance citizens' participation. And if we prove that those instruments are successful, the conference has not to be a one-off, but we can really, in a way, bring in those participatory instruments in the decision-making process of the European Union as a constant, as a permanent feature. And we have to prove that they work, and that means that they're not only amplifying the voice of the loudest, but they are mm -hmm. also giving a voice to disenfranchised groups of society, okay. to the younger generation, as we've heard. And if we make that clear, then that become, can become a permanent instrument and we can make European democracy really better. But I have also to say, it's not a listening exercise. We also have to respond. If it's only about listening, that's not sufficient. We have to make sure that they are also the responsive capacities to answer to what we've heard. Okay, lovely, thank you so much. Uh, so we are almost out of time for our opening session, and so quickly I'm gonna come to my sofa. Uh, Commissioner Ferrer and obviously President Didi Costas, can you tell us what perhaps is your final message or your key message, your takeaway uh, from this opening message? And I've been told in my ear that you both have to be very short. So if you, cut, if you cannot be more than one minute. <laughs> so President Sikoskas, perhaps you could go first. Fantastic. Well, this European Week of Regions and Cities comes at a very crucial moment for Europe. We are right at the end of the pandemic, or at least I hope, and hope. Yeah. at the beginning of the recovery efforts. So it's very important that uh, during these 300 events that will take place uh, this week, we will have the opportunity to discuss on the issues of the recovery and on the problems that regions and cities all across Europe are facing. And the Committee of Regions, the European Committee of Regions, is here to represent these 300 regions and 90,000 municipalities of Europe, the 1.1 million elected politicians on a regional and local level, and to see how together with the good collaboration of the Commission, of other institutions of the European Union, but also of the Member States, we will be able to tackle the problems and give concrete solutions to our citizens. Lovely. And so final words from you, Commissioner Ferrer. Well, I think we all understand how critical this moment is, as President Itzi Costas was saying. We have a huge chance in front of us. It's not a simple one. Don't misunderstand me. It's a challenge. It's a challenge to do it uh, in a climate and green friendly way, to do it in a more digital way. But please understand that cohesion, territorial cohesion is essential for a resilient future. And this means also to engage locally, to combine top down with bottom up approaches, to give a voice to citizens, and to give a special place to our youth. It's the reason why the Commission and the President of the Commission has announced that next year will be the, so 2022 will be the year of the youth. We are talking about next generation. And the worst thing that can happen to a territory is when young people leave and then the region collapses because you only have old people there that are away from everything and everybody. So brain drain, giving jobs, proper jobs to qualified young people is at the center of the agenda. But this also it cannot be territorially blind. So that rebalance our growth because this is the way to make the future sustainable for all of us. And we are leaving the historical moment when we can, we can, we must together outline our future vision 
and our vision for the future and make it work because the instruments are available. So I think it's really very timely and it's, it's a privilege to be able to have such a network in which we can learn from each other yes. and grow together. Thank, thank you. you so much, <laughs> Commissioner, and also thank you, Mr. President. Um, it's been a real pleasure to have you both uh, on set with us and to share all of these uh, little sofas uh, with you. Uh, thank you also to Betty and Alejandro, who've done an awesome job on all of our socials. Thank you as well, and thank you for all those participations and everyone sharing their experiences, comments, and all the live event. It's been lovely, and till next time. <laughs> exactly, yeah. till next time. And of course, to our studio audience, it's been a pleasure, of course, to have you all with us. And to everyone who is watching online and to all of our partners, anyone who is, is, is listening and, try and, and hearing what we've been talking about, I really hope that what you've seen and what you've heard has really given you a flavor of what the 2021 EU Week of Regions and City is all about. I'm Mariam Zaidi, and from myself and the rest of the team here, we wish you a very wonderful uh, European Week of Regions and Cities 2021. Take care. Bye-bye.